Okay, welcome back everyone. I'm headed out to Lake Mead today to get some shots for the next before and after video that'll be coming soon. At the end, I'm going to show what videos we're working on, but in the meantime, there's been a lot going on. Had to make a quick video about it. I've got a lot of info to fit in a short video for you all, so let's get right in it. Now, some of you recall from the last few videos, we've been having some crazy weather here. We were in the culmination of a multi-decade drought. Then you recall the Las Vegas strip flooding in July when monsoon season finally hit. I released my Las Vegas flooding video in the same time period. Go check it out if you haven't yet. So here's a precipitation chart for this year. As you can see, there is flooding right there concentrated right at the end of July when I released the video. Then we had more flooding around mid-August, but nothing now. You'll see at the end of August here, it's been pretty dry. As you look at a weather chart, you can see we are just right back into a dead heat spell like it's summertime again. Look at these high temps. But wait, as of today when I head into the lake here, once again the weather is turning. We have had high winds today, especially near the lake, and more rain and thunderstorms are on the way predicted over the weekend. Will it lead to more flooding? We will have to see. For now, let's take a quick look at the water supply report from the Bureau of Reclamation, dated September 6th the first one this month. As I explained last video, I've color-coded the data so it is easier to track month to month. A red highlight indicates that the number went down from the last report, and a green highlight indicates a number that went up. Starting with Lake Powell, you can see across the board all the numbers have gone down. These first two columns are going to represent how much water is in Lake Powell, and the next column is going to represent how much water is being released. And same with Lake Mead. You can see for Lake Mead, all the numbers have gone up. And you can see the amount of water in Lake Mead has increased since the last report. And also though, the amount being released downstream has also increased. We're gonna once again, go ahead and put up those numbers from the last report, just so you can compare. And the important thing, this video, I want you to keep an eye on is the seven day release numbers. This is really gonna help us understand what's happening with the water. As you can see, Lake Mead went up and that is going to be in large part due to the amount of increased water being released from Lake Powell. We're going to touch on that a little more in just a minute. The reason now for this quick update is for all the information coming out on the water usage in the Colorado River lately. It is really hard to stay on top of the drought situation because of how fluid all the causes are, both natural and man-made. Here you'll see Lake Mead on the map here. So I started searching upstream, not only to Lake Powell, but all the way upstream to where the Colorado River is born in the Rockies. This is where I came across a very informative video recommended by Vegas D Tech, who is also covering the drought. He referenced a video by a channel called The Curious Vita, titled Battle for the Water of the Colorado River. And you can see the caption says, Lake Mead's problems begin here. Let's take a closer look. In this video, he shows how high up in the Rockies, the natural path of rainwater near the Continental Divide was diverted way back in the mid-1900s to actually flow water from the west side of the Rockies back against nature and gravity through a tunnel to the east side of the Rockies, in effect bypassing the Colorado River for the urban centers east of the mountains instead. This was a fascinating video and discovery for me, I must admit. Right in this area, just west of Denver and Boulder is a continental divide nestled up in the Rocky Mountains. So this is theoretically the splitting point between where the water would run east or west, depending on where it lands on the side of the ridge. So all these rivers, streams, tributaries, everything that would run on this west side of the ridge would eventually go into the Colorado River, down through the Grand Canyon, into Lake Powell and Lake Mead. But you'll see instead this reservoir here, the water is piped out underneath the Rocky Mountains through a tunnel and onto the other side, the east side of the ridge, where it can then be distributed around the metro areas. So now before this water even has a chance to form the Colorado headwaters, it was diverted by man for another use. Now obviously this was done for a reason, and from the limited reading I've done, the biggest reason was because most of the population in Colorado is east of the Rockies, so the demand for water is higher than west of the slopes but it also had to do with providing water to areas in the great Midwestern Dust Bowl in the 1930s. Ironically, with the current drought at hand, 
Diverting that water east nearly a century ago may now lead to a similar dust bowl in the southwest. This is all covered much better in the video I referenced to the Curious Vita channel. I'm going to put a link down below in the description. I urge you if you like this topic, go watch their video. He will actually show you boots on the ground, what these reservoirs and the pipeline looks like. Okay, so moving on from the source, another controversial player in the Lake Mead level discussion is of course Lake Powell. Lake Powell is just upstream from Lake Mead and is formed by the Glen Canyon Dam pictured here. The outflow from Lake Powell goes on through the Grand Canyon and ends up feeding Lake Mead. Because of this flow, Powell and Mead are intertwined in a constant dance to maintain and provide water. I just begun working on a multi-point chart that plots data from the weekly water level reports I've been sharing. This is going to be very important because it will illustrate to you in color the shuffle of resources happening between these two lakes. Let's pull that up. So here you're going to see the two main lakes. On the left, Lake Powell, and on the right, Lake Mead. And they're set up this way because keep in mind Lake Powell feeds into Lake Mead. And you'll see the color lines all represent different dates, and it's going to be a two-month time period between July of this year and September of this year, looking at the weekly water supply reports. So in each of these columns, essentially what you're looking at is a time lapse from July through September of this year for each category. So the first category is going to be the content and the second category will be the release. So here what you're seeing is the amount of water in each reservoir and also the amount of water that's being discharged from each reservoir. So if we start back in July looking at the content of Lake Powell, you can see it's steadily declined. It hasn't seemed to even out yet, bottom out, or recover or increase yet. And now what we want to do is take a look at the release from Lake Powell, how much has been coming out and going into Lake Mead. And you'll see for the last three reports, it's steadily increased until the first report of this month in September, where they all of a sudden drop the release rate into Lake Mead back down to a normal level. So now it will be interesting to keep an eye on this number to see if them dropping the discharge will allow Lake Powell to bottom out and maybe start recovering in the next report. So now we'll take a look at Lake Mead's content over the last two months. And you'll see back in July, it doesn't seem to have the same pattern as Lake Powell. It was dropping steadily until right around August 15th, and that was at the culmination of all the floodwaters. Since then, you can see it's been steadily gaining content, even until the last report a few days ago. So many people would speculate that this raised water level was being caused by all the flooding. But this is why it's important to keep an eye on the seven day release numbers. You're going to notice at the red bar where Lake Mead starts to recover on August 15th, it also coincides with when they drop Lake Mead's seven day release drastically. And not only that, if you look farther upstream to Lake Powell, August 15th, the seven day release was drastically increased at the same time. So here what you're going to see happening is Lake Powell is basically a holding reservoir for Lake Mead and steadily increased its release. Lake Mead was finally able to bottom out and start gaining content again. Couple this with the fact that Hoover Dam was releasing drastically less water. It allowed Lake Mead to begin to recover and continue to up until this week. But of course, as we've seen in the past, these changes will be temporary and short lived unless some real significant changes are made. It seems like the fate of Lake Mead is being controlled by things both upstream and downstream. So you can see Lake Mead is not only battling a multi-decade drought, no, it's also battling a diversion at the source and a throttling of its supply in order to save another lake and dam. Don't forget, we haven't even touched on the outflow from Hoover Dam out of Lake Mead into California and Mexico which is unsustainable to begin with doing a simple calculation of supply and demand. It should be getting pretty clear, even to those brand new to this topic, that there is much, much more than a drought happening here. Like I said in the beginning, there's so much going on it's hard to track. Between the federal government and all their inactions, to their bureaucracy, politicians, developers, and environmentalists, it seems everyone has their hand in this jar, yet no one has agreed on any answers or solutions. As pointed out in the chart earlier, it is equally frustrating knowing that with a quick decision and flick of a switch, the Hoover Dam outflow could be throttled and Lake Mead would fully recover, as would everything upstream. 
Unfortunately, due to the blatant inaction of California to get on board with the drought and water restrictions until very recently this year, that will not happen. Here you're going to see Southern Nevada Water Authority Chief singles out California farmers. George Knapp says, The other states in the River Compact have acted like it's no big deal, instead of preparing by implementing water conservation. However, if it's going to happen, the feds will likely have to force it. Southern Nevada Water Authority General Manager John Ensminger issued a scathing letter about the failure of other states to come to the table in a meaningful way. He singled out what he called drought profiteers, for example, the Imperial Valley of Southern California. As the I-Team has reported, that district gets millions of acre feet of water per year and uses much of it to grow alfalfa, a water-intensive crop that is mostly exported to China for animal feed. John said, ordinarily, I stay out of my neighbor's business. But when you have a math problem and 80% of the water use is in agriculture, and 80% of that 80% is for forage crops which are largely exported, it's hard to see how that's not part of the solution. And you know what? I agree with him. Seeing how California is the biggest water user in the lower basin by far, it is high time the hypocrisy ends there and leadership either initiates solutions now or gets out of the way. And every single day wasted now is decades of future progress lost. To really drive this point home, let's take a quick look at the news cycle starting this last week or so. Here you'll see reporting that California should brace for an epic megastorm now. The severe heat and drought have led to new weather patterns that will cause extreme moisture. This weather cycle is crazy. So here we are in the midst of a severe decades long drought and now we will bounce to the complete other side of the pendulum right into severe storms not seen for the last 150 years. Now if you ask me, I try not to speculate here but just follow logic but I can't help but get this nagging feeling that the drought will all of a sudden end, wide-scale southwest precipitation will happen like we've seen hints of, the lakes will all refill, no one will keep conserving water, and everyone will go back to life as usual, forgetting all about this with no lessons learned. Once again, that's just my gut feeling. But you have to look at what's happening. There's already news reporting saying that California should expect an epic megastorm, but yet, is there any action in the state? You would think that every farmer would at this point be digging emergency reservoirs, irrigation ditches, and rain collection devices in anticipation of this coming storm. How much water could be collected with 30 straight days of rain? But yet, once again like always we see no action. What do you think will happen? You think we are going to see epic storms that refill these lakes and also lead to snowpack in the mountains that will flow into the spring? Do you think the storm coming is too little too late? We're going to see, I suppose, in the coming months. As we wrap up here heading out of the lake, you can look at the next weather front coming in up in the sky. This new front is due to bring high winds and some more rain this weekend as I described earlier, along with a drastic drop in temperature. Will this be the end of the summer heat finally? Will Las Vegas flood again? It's going to be interesting to see how this next front plays out. So this should give you a bit of insight on where the next Behind the Drought episodes will be going. There is so much information to go through, but we're going to figure it all out. Before that though, we don't want to veer too far off course from our roots, so we have been working on a new adventure video that will be released soon. If you're into the Old West mining and exploring, you're going to love it. According to the poll on our community page, right behind that, we'll be releasing a Lake Mead before and after part 2, which is what I'm actually working on here in the lake today. Just so much in the works, of course, all possible thanks to you, the viewers. Thank you to all the subscribers. It's free for you all to do, but it really helps us out, so thank you so much. And don't forget, once we finalize our first little giveaway here, you have to be subscribed to be eligible. Thank you again, everyone, for tuning in, and we'll see you all next time. Take care.